Oh, hey there. Tis the season. Let's talk about wide receivers. Okay, so for those of you who do not know everything about all of the media I have ever produced in my entire life, which is probably most of you, here's how Draftness works. I do this every year. I've been doing it since 2016, but it's usually been in written, not video form. But now that the only thing young people like reading is captions on media that they can hear perfectly well, um, I'll jump off that sinking ship and do this year's version on camera. Today... Day two, I'm going to be talking about wide receivers, but I'm not going to be doing it in quite the way that you're probably used to, the way that everybody does it, where they go through the guys in the first round and say what they like, and go through the guys in the second round and say what they like, then third and fourth and so on and so on and so on. Like, there's nothing wrong with that, but you've heard that from about a thousand different people at this point. Uh, I'm just going to give you all of the players in the draft that I think the Lions are going to like. Because the guy I keep hearing about going to the Lions in the first round is Xavier Leggett. And friend, I like his game, but I don't think you take a man among boys, and and that is what Leggett was this year, and use a first round pick on that. Um, like the guy had one year production as a fifth year senior and had less than 40 catches in his four seasons preceding that. Now, the Lions have met with Leggett on numerous occasions. They obviously like him. He is an option to be taken. But at 29, that's a little crazy for me. Who would I like at 29, though? Since I'm trying to be positive here, because I've been accused of being a very negative person. And that's not an entirely inaccurate uh, <laughs> assessment of some things that I've done. Um, guy, I think they will love. Number one. Boom. <laughs> That makes this seem like a ranking. It's not rankings. Because if I tell you I know where these guys are going to go, I am lying. <laughs> like 90% of people who do this sort of thing, like, I have a third round grade on them. Why do you care what my grade is? Mine aren't the ones that matter. Um, but the guy I would take, if, if I were the Lions GM, didn't, you would all hate the world if I was, uh, Jalen Polk. If there is an immediate one-to-one -one replacement as a rookie for what Josh Reynolds gave this team last year, like his first year, as good as Reynolds' fifth or sixth, I, I, probably seventh, whatever, however many years Reynolds has been in the league, Jalen Polk is that good right now. As a rookie, he gives you that. He could be the new smooth operator, the new spider of death. Uh... I'm not going to lie, I did read The Beast before I made these, uh, but it's primarily because Dane Brugler has a lot more access to the off-the-field stuff than I do, so for a lot of guys, that's the thing that matters. Um, after having read that and watched the film, I'm going to say the same thing about Polk that I said about Amon Ross St. Brown in his draft year, and that is that this is the player who should be going in the late first or early second, and why not? Uh, because the NFL sometimes makes some really dumb decisions. Like, this is that guy. I have four guys for the Lions ahead of Jalen Polk, and I don't think any of them are going to get anywhere near pick 29. That's Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, Brian Thomas. That is it. That is the entire list of players I would take ahead of Jalen Polk for what the Detroit Lions do. Does that make sense? Why do I love him that much? <laughs> it's a reasonable question considering you see him frankly ranked a lot lower than this on most boards uh, 2021 the guy get, breaks his collarbone comes back before the season ends so grit check done like most guys frankly don't do that when they have an injury like that that can be an issue but Jim LePolk did uh, no block no rock if there is a better blocking wide receiver in this draft, I didn't see it. Um, it's, it's a massive standout. This guy will like bury anyone that he catches off guard and 
he, he like he takes linebackers and and blocks them to a standstill and run plays. It's phenomenal. Uh, he's also a massive gym rat, but like let's talk about what he does as a wide receiver because that's the job, right? That's the meat of what you actually care about with these guys. Everything else I've just said is kind of window dressing. Uh, this is the window. What does he do? He gets open. He catches the ball. And then when he has the ball, he gets upfield quick. And he follows blocks pretty well. It's not fast, mind you, but quick. And what do I mean by that? What's the difference between those two things? Let's talk about another guy I like, maybe not for the Lions, Keon Coleman. He moves fast. And yes, I saw his 40. That's not what I'm talking about. If you look at GPS times, Coleman's top speed is higher than Polk's. Coleman also does things at that speed that other players just can't. Like, think about it like there's a lot of really fast NHL players, but most of them have hands made of concrete. Works like this. Then you get a guy like Connor McDavid where he's going that fast as, as all these other guys are going, but the, he can do the things that top tier guys can do at that speed. And that's why you got hundred assists this year. That is what I would say about Keon Coleman is that when he is moving at that top speed, it does not diminish what he is capable of in terms of adjusting to and catching the ball. Unlike most players who, when they are running as fast as they can, they can't do anything. So on a deep ball, it has to be a perfect throw. If a guy is running flat out, unless his name is Keon Coleman, in which case, if it's not a perfect throw, he'll adjust to it. He'll make the catch. He'll do what needs to be done. Uh, I would take Coleman's supremely controlled high GPS speed over Xavier Worthy's 4 140 time all day, every day, without even any reservations, basically. Like, uh, because it comes with the ability to make those catches that nobody else can. Whereas like Worthy, I'm not saying Worthy can't catch. That's, he's not that guy who's just fast and he's not James Jett. Uh, but a 165 pound guy running really fast doesn't impress me. Go find me a single 1,000 yard receiver who ran under a 4-3 at the combine and leave that name in the comments. Because like maybe I missed one, but as far as I know, there isn't. It just isn't the thing that ever happens. And like some people would say that, you know, Jared Goff doesn't throw to guys like Coleman who don't get tons of separation. And that, that is an argument that I do kind of struggle with a little bit because like, realistically, if you look up the receivers that he's had, show me the one who resembles Coleman. He's never had that guy. He's never had the jump ball 50, 50 guy. That's not an opportunity he's ever been given in an offense. It's not what Sean McVay wants. It's not what Sean McVay ever brought in while Jared Goff was there. We don't know, frankly, if he will throw to somebody because he's never had anybody he would believe could do this. Like Cooper cup has decent size, but he's not that guy. Same with Reynolds. He's tall, but he's like a skinny guy. He's not a power guy. Like the Rams just didn't take guys like that. And that's also been fairly true. With the lines at this point, the big guys that they have taken have been size, speed, weight guys who can't catch. So are you going to throw that? Like you're going to throw that guy in a crowd? I'm, I'm not. And Neither is Jared Goff. That we do know. This, if he doesn't believe someone's going to make these plays, he's definitely not throwing them the ball. But anyway, like I said, Coleman's probably not a guy that the Lions are going to love as much as I do. I, I have very low hopes of him becoming a Detroit Lion. Uh, unlike Jalen Polk, who I think has a pretty reasonable shot at that. Um, who else we got here? Back to you guys I think the Lions are going to love, since I just talked a whole bunch about a guy that I don't even think they're going to take. <laughs> uh -huh. Ricky Pierce though. Well, what is there to say about this guy? Uh, really, really good player once he crawled out from under the absolute garbage quarterback that Florida had last year. And I'm not joking. Um, but this is not that video. Uh, this is what I kind of struggled with because I think the Lions are really going to like the guy. But he on the surface, seems like he might play kind of a similar role to what Almond Ross St. Brown does, but he, like athletically, they're not the same, but in terms of like what position they're going to play on the field most often, 
that 50-50 slot outside spot is probably what we're looking at for Pearsall's future. Like, he can play on the outside, he can play on the inside. Which one of those do you need? That's probably what Ricky Pearsall becomes for whoever drafts him. Uh, well, my theory is this. If you're going to pay Elmer Ross St. Brown $25 million a year, which they are, you kind of need to know that he could just be a guy who just wins and wins on the inside, wins on the outside. I think we're going to probably see more of a 60 40 split this year in terms of it was 50 50 last year, almost exactly even slightly more as an outside receiver than a slot. I think that's going to increase. Which means you need somebody who can play those slot snaps or flip with Elman Ross St. Brown, depending on where the particular guy is who is going to be susceptible to what each of those players bring. Because like I said, they don't win the same way necessarily. Same position, don't win the same way. Where is the guy that each of those people is going to be able to exploit? That is where the Lions play them. That is how this offense works. So this list isn't going to be just a list of every six foot four, 210 pound receiver in this class because they need an X. I don't think the Lions think of it that way. I don't think you should think of it that way. It's really only national media that are kind of thinking that way, realistically. But with that said, I don't think they're going to take Roman Wilson uh, because a slot receiver is what he is, and there's really not a lot else that he can do. Whereas like someone like Pearsall lines up everywhere, wherever you want him to. And it just gives you more options. Uh, the downside on Pearsall, the reason he's going to go later than I think a lot of people are pushing him up right now is because he's going to be 24 in his rookie year. So you're right now going like, okay, well, how come I'm dogging the get and how come I'm not dogging Pearsall? And the thing is, I think they're both going to go in that same spot. Like the Lions' second, third round pick is about where both of those guys should go. But one of them is being spoken of as though he might be a top 20 player. And the other one is being spoken of like maybe he goes in the second. So I think Pearsall's pre-draft analysis of where he's going to go in the draft is just a lot closer than Leggett's is. Or where I think Leggett's should be. Uh, let's move on to just some day three guys that I think are, the Lions are going to love. Um, this is where like just backing up St. Brown and that's all you can do stops being an issue <laughs> because day three guys, if they can do that, you're happy. That's realistically speaking around five through seven. You are not expecting these players to ever become starters or you have unrealistic expectations of what the players who get drafted here can be every once in a while one does, but it's not the expectation. So you're looking for guys who can play special teams or are raw enough that maybe over a few more years, they mold into something better. And the best example I can think of of that is Luke McCaffrey. He fits that mold of a guy who might become much, much more than he is. And he's really raw, despite the fact that I believe he is a fifth year senior. I, of course, don't have that written in my notes because why would I have complete notes? Um, <laughs> but... Like he's only been playing receiver for a couple seasons. Prior to that, he was a quarterback. I love wide receivers who used to be quarterbacks. The reason for that is that they generally pay more attention to things like down and distance, where the sticks are, than guys who have just run fast and caught the ball and followed instructions. Guys like Julian Edelman, Cooper Cup, Heinz Ward, Anquan Bolden, and Lions wide receiver coach Antoine Randall L are all players who fit that mold and fall into this list. They just tend to be better players cerebrally because they've thought about the game of football more than most wide receivers ever have to. And did you think I was just going to rattle off a bunch of white dudes there? Shame on you. Um, the ones who fail to make that transition are the ones who can't catch. Uh, and there have been plenty of those, but Luke McCaffrey can catch. He makes heady plays. He's worth one of those round five, six, seven picks. Uh, Brendan Rice he is a guy who has more than just a famous dad. Uh, he's big. He can get the catch. He runs nice routes. Uh, Bishop Brown went over him in depth on their receiver show, so I'm not going to retread that and go super deep on him, but I really like what he brings to the table. Like, he is a big, smart receiver with good athleticism who can catch and that's 
when you start getting into round four and later, that's a nice list of things because there aren't a lot of those guys. And, uh, okay, so let's go with a weird one, though. Let's, who's the guy that I'm planting my flag for in this draft? Ryan Flournoy out of Southeast Missouri State. In any of his film, he's basically the only guy on the field with an NFL body. So his tape is ridiculous. Like, and the cool thing about watching FCS games, though, is usually the only camera in the building is the all 22 camera. So like, even if you're watching broadcast, it's showing you the entire field, unless the guy running the camera is awful. Um, <laughs> it's easy to get like reps of who this person is without working too hard. Unlike, you know, if you're watching ESPN footage of an SEC game, the receiver disappears half a second into the play and then shows up if the ball goes into his area again. So you have to actually go find legitimate all 22 coaches film. If you want to have anything to say about those guys, just a little, you know, behind the curtains, how the sausage is made for any draft coverage. Uh, <laughs> he has the issues you'd expect from a small school or receiver. Like his footwork is not great. His routes are not polished, but the thing is, if he had those skills at that level of football, I don't think I would be that interested in him because you can teach those skills. And at the senior bowl, he was a guy who immediately popped all the time because on day one, he was kind of popping for some negatives. So I was like, okay, maybe this small school guy's not that good. But by day three, every time I was trying to find any kind of footage in the practice film for any time that Florno was taking the rep. That, that Florno is where the quarterback went with the ball every time because he was just getting open. He was burning everybody like crispy, crispy bacon. Uh, yeah. Um, as a player, immediately, going to be fairly limited in what he offers you, <laughs> to, to be blunt. But he's got the athleticism to catch on playing special teams. And everything you read about this guy's personality in terms of his work ethic, his willingness to help out teammates, the fact that he was a team captain the entire time he was at Southeast Missouri State. Like he's, he's a guy that I would bet a day three pick on without any issues. You know what I mean? I wouldn't feel bad about him, but he's not a guy who gets talked about a lot in terms of draft stuff. Like he wasn't even in PFS draft simulator. They may have changed that in the last week. I haven't done one in a while, but a week ago, you couldn't take him in a mock draft at PFF. So I'd, I'd be really excited if this was the guy who made everyone go, who? At the draft this year? When Holmes takes him in some ridiculously high round that even I wasn't considering, I'll just be like, oh, I like that guy. Hopefully this is him. Um, other day three guys I like at receiver, but are not my like this guy is awesome. Flag plant. Uh, Josh Cephas catches everything. So if you want a possession guy who can be a special teams body and not kill you if you get a rash of injuries during a game, that's a good bet. Um, Jackson Janky, I like him because he plays receiver like an outfielder. If, like I don't think even the high end guys in this draft track the ball as well as he does and just get themselves into a position to make an easy catch. That's the one thing I would say about Keon Coleman sometimes where I don't love about his game is that sometimes he is running at top speed and he keeps running at top speed and that makes the catch harder to make. Jackson Janky slows down. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's his superpower, finding and tracking balls. South Dakota State. This is really the only thing he brings to the table is just he, he does adjust to balls really well. I don't know if that's enough to draft a guy. That's a superpower. Maybe is the underdrafted free agent practice squad guy. Uh, I'm going to do one more guy uh, because, like I said yesterday, I'm not super impressed with day three of this draft, so I don't have a ton of gems <laughs> at a lot of positions this year. Like, there's a bunch of guys who are just just guys. You know what I mean? Like, they'll, they'll draft somebody, and they, maybe he'll be fun. Uh, John Giles I, was an interesting name that I'll freely admit I had never heard of until I read The Beast. Uh, I wasn't going to just randomly decide to check out tape on this kid out of Western Florida. I didn't have a lot of time this year. I haven't found a lot of full games to watch. There are a couple out there that you, that if you really, really want to dig a whole bunch, you, you could go get. Um, 
but his highlight reel is the funniest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> the stiff arms and trucks that this guy was putting on people who just had no business playing this sport at the same level as a receiver who is six foot two, 220 pounds and ran an acceptable 40 time. Like it was, it was like watching just the talent disparity that there used to be in like a fifties or sixties football game where like Jim Brown was just not the same era of human being as the people he was playing with. That's a lot of what you get out of watching John Giles highlight reels. <laughs> uh, they're, they're funny. Um, He's 24 years old. He could not academically qualify for college for four years. But the reason I'd be betting on him as like a round six, round seven undrafted free agent is that he blocked three kicks in college. I don't care if he can pass first year university classes, if he can give me one or two blocked punts a year <laughs> on a league minimum deal and maybe run really fast straight down the sideline. A couple times a year when I had a bunch of injuries at receiver and needed somebody to come in and just, just run go routes. Uh, do yourself a favor. Go watch his highlight reels. They're, they're fun. They're really fun. It's like if Bauman Ross A. Brown went and played like at high school practice as a joke. <laughs> um, but the thing is like there are upside things there too. Like the guy has great body control. Like he made some ridiculous circus catches and toe taps and it doesn't matter who's covering you when you make catches like that. He does some things that most guys can't do. That's probably why he kept getting chances at all of these places where he just couldn't get his academics straight. And he does that while he's also blocking guys out of their shoes. And again, level of competition. But that's what you want to see from a guy at that level of competition if he's going to potentially make your NFL team. Um, that's my receiver rundown. I don't think they draft a slot guy before their third round pick. And even then, I kind of doubt it. Uh, I don't think they'll draft anyone who has in inconsistent effort. So, like, I don't think A.D. Mitchell is going to be a lion. I know the stuff came out recently that he does have type 1 diabetes and he hasn't been dealing with that well. I think the Lions are a team that is going to look at that as, okay, well, why hasn't he been dealing with it? That is a fairly easy to deal with medical issue. You just have to be a little bit disciplined so that lack of discipline, I think, is going to be a problem. Um, I'm not as high on Lad McConkey as a lot of people are. Like, he's fine. I'm not going to be mad if they do that, but I don't love him. <laughs> uh, I love Troy Franklin off this list because he's too skinny. Again, just has no power in his game at all. Like, people throw out Devontae Smith. Like, he's a reason it's okay to be 175 and 6'1". Uh, but Franklin's nowhere near that good of a player, like not even close on his best day. So I, I can't imagine the Lions taking that risk. Plus he drops balls. If you don't want to know why, sorry, if you do, if you don't want to know, don't ask. If you do want to know why I didn't like someone else or why they didn't make the list, just ask me in the comments and I'll get to it. Oh, uh, <laughs> right. I'm doing tight ends on this one too. Because like there are so few that I like in this draft, I don't, I'm not giving them a full episode. There's just no, I, I can't fill five minutes with that. I don't think they need to draft one bluntly. Like particularly with Brock Wright's three-year deal that he just signed for two years at least with a very nice cap hit. Like if I were, if, if I had to, Theo Johnson out of Penn State, six six two sixty, round three or later, that's fine. It's a linear athlete, kind of gives you more Brock Wright-ish stuff, which like as tight end three is phenomenal, <laughs> bluntly, probably more than you need. Like he doesn't get a lot of yak, but if you give him the ball, make him run in a straight line, he will run until somebody tackles him, which doesn't sound like much. It sounds like that should be table stakes for an NFL player, but the sheer number of guys who think they are more athletic than they are and don't just eat up as much ground as they can quickly as possible because they were athletic enough to do other things at lower levels, but will not be in the NFL. That's there's a legion of those guys. Uh, the other tight end tip Riemann, uh, real nice tape for a big guy. If they want a blocking tight end that makes it so they don't have to use their swing tackle in short yardage, 
quite as often. That's what Tip Raymond brings you immediately. Uh, but he does have some like nice receiving tape. He's never going to be a guy who beats you with his quicks because like he's a giant of a man. But he can catch. And on kind of your your basic tight end stuff, like he's not going to take over Sam Laporta's job. They're, they're not the same kind of player. They don't really play the same position. Like He's not a power slot. He's a old school Y tight end. Uh, and I got to be honest, I don't see anything else in this draft that I would even bother with if I was the Lions. Like they might pick a guy who's similar to someone they already have. Uh, like if Brock Bowers falls to 29, you don't not do that because you took Sam Laporta. You can find a way to use both of those. Those are both great pieces. Anyway, that's it for receivers and tight ends. Toodles!